You're listening to The Roots, a podcast from Minnesota AMA District 23 Armca. I'm your host, Jackie Reese. Let's dive deeper into what makes our district so great. This podcast was prepared by an independent contractor and may not be the views of the board of directors of District 23 Armca or any of their sponsors or affiliates. Welcome everybody to episode 22 of The Roots, joined today by a guy who's very involved with District 23 Armca in many, many ways, Jack Mackey. Jack, how's it going tonight? Good, how about you? Good, thanks. So we were talking the other day and you said you you feel like a lot of people know you, but they might not know a whole lot about you. So I'm really excited to share your story with everybody um, and hopefully you are too. So let's start at the beginning. How did motorcycling begin for you? Um, basically, my dad started off in the late 80s riding or racing road bikes like Brainerd and you know, Road America and that type of thing, and decided he wanted to get into dirt bikes. So he bought himself a bike, bought my brother a PW50. And then when it was time for me to ride, it was, you know, as soon as you can ride a bike without training wheels, you can ride the PW. So I remember the day, remember dad with the bicycle in the garage, taking the training wheels off, and then Shortly after I was out on the PW and I don't know, I just never have stopped riding since it's, it's been super fun. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's a pretty common story for a lot of people who get into dirt biking. Um, did you have any bad crashes on that first ride by yourself? I know I personally did. <laughs> Not that I remember. I mean, it was just doing laps around the yard, but I don't, I don't know. I guess I don't remember many real bad crashes right away. Good. Yeah. You had better throttle control than I did, I guess. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you now compete in the double A class in enduro and hair scrambles. Um, take us through how you moved through the ranks as you grew older on those dirt bikes. Well, I started out, I, uh, in, I think it was 2008 and 2009. I got a couple of 50 CC championships and then moved up to 65s right away, which I was racing 50s and 65s same time for a little while. Um, and then ended up getting two 65 championships in 2012 and then moved up to 85s and then just kind of was still doing pretty decent and moved up kind of before I had to from each class and started riding with some faster people and um probably the the biggest thing that helped me make double a that first year was uh at the huntersville national i was on a a row with a guy who used to race here tim nino he was kind of one of the top guys for quite a while but uh started riding with him a bunch i was on a row with him at the national and yeah i think i ended up 44th overall and ended up I think sixth overall of district 23 guys. So yeah, that helped a lot getting into double A and then just kind of, you know, being in a faster class, it helps and just keeps you motivated and staying going fast every time. For sure. For sure. Um, do you have any crazy stories from over the years? Maybe there was a notable trip that you took a specific race. You had mentioned that national enduro, um, just a crazy memory from over the years of racing. Um, I don't know. There hasn't been much too crazy. I mean, like, like I say that, that Huntersville national is really cool. Um, just, one one cool thing with that race was uh, the last section of the day was uh, A class only, A double A pro, whatever. Um, and we were on row four. And I remember it, it was super cool. It had rained the night before. So like the trails just super fresh. There was one tire track ahead of me. And it was just Tim. It was, it was pretty cool. That's awesome. But, it's yeah, cool that was we were going fast. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going fast is fun for sure. Um, so 
as we were talking before, um, your 2021 season had some ups and some downs, notably your AA Enduro Championship, which was followed by um, a, may I say, catastrophic shoulder injury that cut the hair scramble season <laughs> short for you. Uh, how is 2021 in your perspective? Overall, I think it's been a super, super good year. I mean, it started off, you know, hair scrambles is doing okay in the in the spring and then the Huntersville Enduro won that one um and then I think the worst I did at an Enduro was a fourth overall at uh the Dayton Enduro but otherwise a couple of second places and I was super happy about that um then yeah I just you know had a had a pretty good hair scramble series ended up fourth, even though I missed the last one, but yeah, I just, you know, this is my, basically my first major injury of any kind yet. So I'm all right with that being this, this late into my racing career, you know? But. Yeah. So kind of, what do you attribute that to? There's, you know, I went through a phase of getting hurt when I was transitioning from little bikes to big bikes. Um, what do you attribute your success in staying healthy to? Um, I think just kind of like, you know, it, it was always instilled in me, like, you know, growing up to learn how to ride before you go fast and just, you know, I've always kind of been cautious in riding and just don't really ride over my head too much. So I think that helps a lot and just, trying to have good technique and, you know, stay upright as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've talked a little bit here about your racing, but you're not only known as a racer, lots of people know you uh, for your work behind the camera as a photographer. At what point were you like, hey, I, I wanna give this a try. I wanna, I wanna become a photographer and, and shoot some dirt bike riding. So a friend of ours growing up, a uh, guy named Mike Pohl, he, he was always a friend of photography, would go to all the races and take photos. And um, He ended up passing away, and I think it was 2017. And, you know, for the next few years, it was like nobody was really doing photos at the races. I guess I just saw an opportunity and ended up, you know, getting a camera and starting to take photos and just really enjoy it and getting getting a little better at it took a little while to really kind of kind of learn what I was doing but I I think people enjoy it and I like you know when people post my photos and I like seeing them around it's cool yeah for sure how do you think it's changed over time your photography and what do you have in store for the future um, I don't know, just like, as far as changing it, it just like finding better shots and upgrading to better equipment and stuff. And, um, yeah, I ended up buying a new camera last, last spring. That was, that was a big deal. I, you know, probably spent more money than I should have at the, mo at the time, but it definitely, uh, helped out the quality, but yeah. And then, uh, Lately, I've been getting more into the video side. So my plan is for this year to uh, do some more video stuff and hopefully get like one, at least short video of, of every race. Not Probably not really like a vlog style, more like uh, just a, a recap type thing, but that should be cool. I'm excited. Yeah, and so are we here at District 23 Armka. You've been a big help to us um, with our social media and our website, our articles, everything like that. So we really appreciate, you know, you giving back not only to the racers, but to the organization here itself. Yeah, I've been really excited to see, see my photos on the District 23 pages and, you know, see just, <laughs> like I scroll through the, the Instagram page and it's like, I think about 50% of the photos in the last year are all mine. It's, I like it. It's cool. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I enjoy it too, right? Like that's my, my area of um, 
volunteering here too. And it's super convenient for me. You can just go on your website, 100mn.com, if I'm correct. Yep. Um, and download off of all of the uh, Google Drives and you have them up for free. Of course, donation is how you um, support continuing to do this but maybe speak a little bit about how people have supported you in your photography experience. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, like you said, it's mainly just, you know, people, you know, sending money for taking photos at each race. I, I don't, I don't require payment because I like growing up, there would be photographers that would show up and you know, the only way that you could get a nice photo is you pay them whatever. It feels like $5 a photo or whatever, but it's like I, that always bugged me growing up. And like I, I'm doing all right without, you know, needing to do that. So it it's just uh, normally people will send me from through Venmo. That's the, the easiest way to do it. But, um, yeah, just been a lot of nice people, you know, at every race. There's a lot of consistent people that always, you know, give me give me a little bit for being out there and stuff. It definitely, definitely helps a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. So taking a spin here, not only are you the racer, you're the photographer, but now you want to be even further involved with motorcycle racing. You decided to become a trail boss for the 2022 Troll Hog and Hair Scrambles. How did that come about? How did you decide to take that on? So I've been helping out there for the past, I want to say five or six years and just kind of like almost working my way through the ranks there, I guess you could say. Like the last couple of years, I've had my own section of trail. Last year, it was like, I think about four miles and just kind of was able to do whatever I want with it. And that was really, really cool to me. And then uh, the current or now past trail boss, Dan Banks, he, uh, he's been doing it for quite a few years and he, he wanted to be out of it so nobody else was really stepping up and I really wouldn't want to see that race go away like that's seems to be everybody's favorite and I absolutely love riding there so saw it as an opportunity to keep it going and he's going to help out a lot just you know with different stuff that I wouldn't even think of as far as the the race goes but uh yeah, it should be cool. I'm hoping to make a little bit of changes and really uh, make a race that everybody enjoys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for some of us who may not be as familiar, including myself, what does a trail boss do? Um, you'd mentioned Dan's going to help you along the way, kind of groom you towards becoming a better trail boss, things that you might not have thought about. Um, what are some of those things that the average viewer, listener might not totally understand? So like there's there's kind of the obvious stuff, you know, like race day stuff, whether it's riders meeting, you know, finalizing the course, making sure signups going smoothly, make sure scoring's going smoothly, but also it's a lot of planning. It's you know, like coordinating with the venue. We have to coordinate with a uh four by four Jeep club that runs events there. So like we had to go to their meeting in November, lock in a date and, you know, just like that type of stuff. And then obviously it's like the, the whole course design and like planning all the work days. Cause I mean, normally it's probably, I'm going to say four or five weekends before the race that we're all out there. We're putting in hours, you know, cutting trail, laying out trail, grooming it, you know, putting up arrows, putting up caution tape and all that stuff. And, and then it's, yeah, like figuring out what everybody's doing on race day. Um, just kind of like a lot of, a lot of coordination with volunteers, which we have a lot of really, really good volunteers that help us out. Um, 
it, within the, the Norseman Motorcycle Club and also other racers that just want to help out. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot of work, definitely a lot of stuff that I probably haven't even thought about yet, but definitely gonna gonna give it my best shot. And I think I'll, I'll have a lot of people behind me and giving me some good support. Yeah, I think so too. You mentioned you want to make a couple changes. What were those changes in your mind? Um, kind of just like trying to make it a more fun race course for everybody. Um, we always try and do some some longer laps there so that you don't you don't end up having to pass quite as many people at the end of the race. You know, being a faster rider. Um, but also, uh, I'm hoping to put a couple of more, more, you know, like, I don't know if I'd say challenging, but kind of more interesting trails in there. Maybe some flowy stuff, maybe some tighter stuff. Um, we, have, we have a lot of options there with how we can run the course. So, I mean, it, it's kind of just going to depend, like, next spring, summer when we go out there and start laying out the course, like figuring out all that stuff. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question. How does how does the trail prep influence the racing? I've only done a handful of hair scrambles here, um, but in your opinion, what are the best aspects of a trail that makes for interesting racing? So like the biggest thing I would say is just like making sure that you have multiple lines in the woods because the worst thing is, you know, you're, you're in the middle of your race, you're chasing somebody and you come up on three or four slower riders that are a lap down and you have to try and pass them. And if, you know, there's nowhere to pass them, it makes it really, really hard to, to make up ground back on whoever you're following. Or you could also be, you know, racing someone. And if there's not really an opportunity to pass it, you know, all you're gonna do is sit behind them. But uh, there's a few there's a few courses in Minnesota that do really think, and there's a few that could definitely improve upon that. But it kind of depends like how how the trail's laid out and how how the trail you know like gets gets lines in it. Because if you make it to where multiple lines are vid visible and like easy to get to they'll both get used but otherwise it's like you know it'll be one line and if, if it's wet or soft or anything like that you know it turns into one rut and then you can't get out of the rut it's it's a lot of like planning and kind of like visualizing as you're laying off the course and grooming the course like you know mowing and cutting branches off and stuff like that try and make stuff like you know when you're coming up to something so you can actually see like multiple lines through there yeah that's awesome and it's awesome to hear that we have a top racer thinking about things like that you know it's not um maybe someone less experienced than you it's it's really cool to hear that you're able to visualize those lines and put them in place for us more novice off-road riders here. <laughs> uh, so another thing that I'm very curious about is your involvement with a club. There's not a whole lot of racers that are also involved with a club. Um, how have the Norsemen specifically influenced your motorcycling experience? Um, it's There's actually quite a few racers that are in, in clubs, like the, the Golden Eagles is pretty big. Um, the Straight Arrows is fairly big. There's a new club uh, or a newer club that used to run the Kensington race that they have a few racers and like the Norsemen, I don't even remember how many members we have, but we have quite a few racers and it's just nice to have a, a group of people that's willing to help out at many races and willing to put on races. Um, it is it is nice to have like the support from them also um but yeah it's more it to me it's mostly uh just like 
uh, a way to coordinate a bunch of people to put races on. How does a club decide to put on a race? You know, that at some point, uh, I feel like a club gets so big that, hey, like, let's put on a race. At what point are they like, let's do that? Um, I'll, I would say some of the time it's, you know, one, one club might get out of putting on a race at a venue or somebody finds a new venue to put on a race. Um, I haven't really been involved in too much of that like the as far as the new races go but yeah I I think it's just like you know somebody comes up with an idea like oh man this place would be super cool to have a race at and talk to the landowner and they're willing to do it so then yeah that's where the club steps in and one person might take care of like you know making sure they have the right permits and stuff one person might take care of like you know is this, you know, enough land to make a course? And then it's just coordinating, like putting in trails and kind of doing all the planning stuff. Cool. Yeah, it's a real team effort to put on an event like that. I can imagine so much work, like you had mentioned, weeks and weeks of preparing just for one single event. So it's, it's amazing to have those people still in the community and still wanting to put on races for sure. And I would like to um, really encourage other people like racers. It, yeah, you get the worker points. And a lot of people, it seems like just kind of work the minimum, you know, 24 hours of work prior to a race to get their worker points. But it's like, I, I don't think most people realize how much work actually goes into putting on like a hair scramble or especially an enduro where there's, you know, anywhere from 40 to 70 miles of course to get ready for the race and so i i would just encourage people to you know and reach out to a club and make sure that you know you're you're putting in enough work to make everybody else's life a little easier yeah i think that's a good time for me to plug our new position in 2022 we added a volunteer coordinator named brandon vanelli a fellow off-road racer so brandon is going to be working with the clubs and promoters in all disciplines but especially off-road to help coordinate and fill those needs to help the clubs put on the events um, throughout the summer so if anyone is uh, looking for opportunities to help out brandon is the guy to go to so we've talked about your racing, your photography, your volunteering. Is there anything else that Jack Mackey likes to do for fun? Um, the past couple of years, I've uh, really gotten more into mountain biking. It's really good training tool for off-road, especially, you know, it's single track. It's, you know, you go with a few buddies and you're racing them hard and trying to keep up but uh i don't know otherwise i like to do uh some snowboarding in the winter time i mean i, I haven't been doing that this year just because i don't want to <laughs> you know fall and re-injure myself but uh yeah I, I don't know i'd say otherwise i live kind of a boring life outside of motorcycles but <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, motorcycling is a pretty exciting thing to do. Um, another thing that we haven't really touched on is your current collegiate status. Tell us a little bit about what you're learning in college here. Yeah, so I'm uh, going to school at St. Cloud State University and working towards a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Kind of something that I've been working on for a few years. I kind of been taking it slower and st staying working and keeping up with uh tuition but uh yeah I'm I'm excited for that it's it's a field where you can go a lot of different directions and I I would love to be in power sports industry that would be really cool but it's kind of just going to depend upon you know what's available and uh who's hiring kind of thing, but yeah, I'm excited. 
excited to be done in a couple of years or a year or however long it's going to take. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no kidding. Um, it's cool to to hear that everything in your life you wanted to revolve around motorcycling. And I think a lot of us that are very invested in the sport uh, feel like that, that we can do it all the time. So that's awesome to hear that you feel similarly. Yeah. So what advice do you have for other D23 ARMCA members that might look up to you because of all these different, totally different categories of things that you do within the sport? Um, well, as far as like riding dirt bikes, I, I think I've heard a few other people talking about this, but like, honestly, the biggest things are riding as much as you can and riding with people that are faster than you because like you can learn so much stuff just by you know watching somebody who's faster or asking them like you know how are you doing this or you know like how how do I get faster what am I doing wrong that type of thing and then I would say like uh if it was somebody trying to get into photography basically just like you know, even start off with just using your phone or, you know, cheap camera and just kind of start taking photos and see kind of what other people are doing. And I don't know, almost kind of like find, find what you can do different. Cause that's kind of what I've been trying to do is like almost, I, I almost want to get like a, a racer's perspective or like what a racer would want as far as photos but yeah like I like I say just kind of like ease your way into it you don't have to have the best stuff just you can learn a lot with minimal equipment yeah absolutely I uh I will share a secret here most of the district content that doesn't come from you that I make myself is done on my iPhone <laughs> so mm -hmm. just like you said just get out there and start doing it um, yeah. what does the future look like for you? We, we know that you had that shoulder injury. Are you going to remount the horse? Are you going to go for another championship next year? I would love to. I, I think, I think I should have plenty of time to get ready for the season. Um, it's kind of just going to depend on how fast it heals, but I would love to at least race the whole Enduro series and hopefully be as competitive as last year. I don't know how that's gonna go. It's kind of still unknown. Um, I haven't been able to do a whole lot as far as trying to get ready for the season yet, but do still have a bit of time. Um, but yeah, I would say it's just kind of gonna, gonna depend upon how the healing goes and how much riding I'm able to do in the spring. But I would, I would love to, uh, try and compete for another championship and I don't know, try and try and race as much as I can. We'll see how it goes though. For sure. That's great to hear. Jack, thank you for joining us for episode 22 of The Roots. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everybody else for listening. We will see you in two Mondays for another episode. See ya. Thanks for joining us. Catch us every other Monday wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on our YouTube page. 